Hi, everybody. My name is Natalie Yeadon, and I'm the CEO and um, co-founder with Impetus Digital. At Impetus Digital, we've built some of the best in class asynchronous and synchronous virtual collaboration tools. We help life science country, uh, companies over um, across the globe over the past 12 years to help them virtualize all of their meetings, including advisory boards, medical education, steering committees, investigator meetings, and even recently big corporate events, hackathons, um, innovation hubs, and everything in between. But more importantly, we really believe at Impetus that everything starts with a conversation. And from those big, hairy, audacious conversations with the provocateurs, the leading edge thinkers, the digital entrepreneurs, we can actually all work collectively to positively disrupt healthcare. And so I'm really pleased to have a couple of these great thinkers at the table. Super excited to have Deborah Collier with us today. Deborah Collier is actually a prominent patient advocate. She's a speaker and an author. She's also the founder and president of Patient Advocates in Research, also called PAIR. Um, this is actually an international communication network of patient advocates across multiple disease areas um, who also work with research communities and advocacy organizations. And we're gonna get into a little bit of that today as well. She is a computer industry executive who uses her communication, organizational and leadership abilities to produce solutions between medical research, healthcare organizations and patient communities. And she's also recognized as a leader at grassroots national and international levels. Finally, she also works with health literacy media, also called HLM, on their clearly communicating clinical trials, which is called C3T. Um, this is a program that translates complex research into really clear concepts that people can understand and can use to improve their health while sp sponsors can help meet their regulatory requirements. I also wanna take a couple of minutes to introduce you to Catherine Gunther. Catherine is actually a senior leader. She's experienced in driving culture of health and performance in Fortune 100 global businesses. She has experience in developing award-winning approaches to understand, address, and materially improve well-being to unlock human potential, as well as to increase the share value for the business, shareholders, and society. She sits on the board of directors of the Population Health Alliance, or PHA. It's a nonprofit organization that's focused on population health management. And it also represents stakeholders from across the healthcare ecosystem that seeks to help improve health outcomes, optimize the consumer and provider experience, as well as drive affordability. So some of her previous roles include vice president, global population health and vice president, strategy and commercial model innovation, both at, more, at Merck. And last but not least, I wanna introduce you to uh, Katina O'Leary. Katina is an experienced CEO with a demonstrated history of working in the hospital and healthcare industry. She is a skilled in nonprofit organizations, program evaluation, volunteer management, public speaking, and all kinds of fundraising. She has a PhD in social work from Washington University in St. Louis. Currently, she is the president and CEO of Health Literacy Media. And we just talked about that a minute ago. And so you can see where the, the connections are here. So that's a company that's focused on infusing health literacy strategies into every aspect of health information to make it really easy to understand and act upon by patients. So among some of the core activities, she helps to oversee, or oversee the Clearly Communicating Clinical Trials or that C3T program that we just mentioned. And under her leadership, the organization has become a true partner to broad spectrum of health organizations from across the globe with the primary goal to empower people with health information that they can actually use. So welcome everybody. Thank you to the sh joining the show today. We can actually get started. I'm going to uh, start with you, Deborah. Um, tell, you know, you have a fascinating background, obviously a very esteemed um, career tra trajectory. Maybe I was wondering if you can share with the group how you ended up being in this really interesting place, working 
with patient advocates and research of the PEAR organization. What brought you here and what exactly does PEAR do? Okay, um, well, uh, PEAR was founded by myself and another person uh, after we had both become patients. As you mentioned, I was an executive in a computer company when I was very much younger and had no gray hair whatsoever um, <laughs> and was diagnosed with my first cancer. It became very public when my boss, who was a VP in the company, put it in the company newsletter, which was <laughs> quite interesting since he hadn't asked me for any consent, but um, that's okay. I, I, my <clears throat> life has been an open book for the most part. Um, I immediately started to realize I didn't know anything about cancer at that time. I didn't know what treatments were available to me, what was known, what wasn't known. And as my husband and I uh, started searching through the information, um, it became really clear that we didn't know enough. Uh, as a patient, it's like being thrown into onto a new planet without any type of roadmap dictionary or any type of survival training. So it's very much like being thrown in the deep end of a pool when you're two years old and try to figure out how, you're, how you need to get your way out. Um, that led us to a group that was um, getting started in the San Francisco Bay Area at the time, which is where I still live, uh, who realized that we needed to start taking charge of our own lives both as self-advocacy when you are a patient, because you're the one that has to put all the information together. The health system does not do that in the United States for you. And, um, and that we needed to actually figure out why things were the way they were and how to make them better. So I quickly went through the different types of patient advocacy that are out there, which include more traditional roles like political advocacy, direct patient support, uh, fundraising, um, things like that, even watchdog advocacy, which is what was going on with the AIDS movement at the time. And I realized we didn't have anybody involved in research. And unless we changed the mindset of the researchers and the way research worked, we were not going to make the kind of advances that we really need to, for better patient outcomes. And so PEAR kind of formed as a loose network. It was one of the first uh, online networks and has continued to be uh, purposely formed as kind of an informal communication network rather than an organization that has to perpetuate itself. Love it, it's fantastic. And there are over 200, well, there are about 300 people involved in PEAR who are patient advocates of other patient disease organizations. Fantastic. Moving over to you, Catherine, um, and your like to find out a little bit about your trajectory and how you ended up getting involved with the Population Health Alliance or PHA. And if you can speak a little bit to see where the relationships may exist with PEAR. Sure. Um, so I have been in healthcare my entire career. I, I started with Merck and rose through the ranks uh, and then was a founding director at Astra Merck, which became AstraZeneca. Uh, then I had my own consulting firm doing boutique uh, strategy consulting for, uh, for healthcare executives, and then came back to Merck uh, with a wonderful opportunity to work with Julie Gerberding. And I've spent the last five years really in the health and well being space, which was new to me, but enabled me to take all that I had learned and sort of uh, move it forward and drive a culture of health and well being at the organization. So I'm now uh, a member of the board of directors for Population Health Alliance. I'm also a member of the board of several organizations and I'm working as a consultant um, to really focus on employee health, population health and um, mental health and well-being as an area that seems to be uh, of acute interest right now across the board. And Population Health Alliance is, is a terrific organization. I've been a, a, a member for a short period of time. It's a 501c nonprofit um, established in 1999 to really bring together a diverse set of stakeholders to look at uh, evaluating health approaches with a population health lens, which 
sounds normal, but it's not always an approach that every stakeholder takes. And what's fascinating is that this group, because it has such diversity of representation across the healthcare ecosystem, can look at a problem and a, and a contemporary problem we're facing right now is uh, COVID-19 vaccine adoption and acceptance. And so how can these stakeholders together look at that population health opportunity and really think through ways to advance vaccination rates and coverage so that we can get through this pandemic as, as soon as possible with everyone sort of weighing in with their perspectives and, um, and you know, perhaps in some ways redesigning their business models to contribute to that, to that goal. So, um, you know, the, the Population Health Alliance objectives really is to um, be the number one trusted sort of go-to organization for questions and learning and opportunities to advance causes like that, leveraging population health principles, and also just to really radically improve the, the health outcomes and health equity um, in the in the U.S., it's it's really, the scope is really the U.S. Um, you know, I think it's um, it's critically important to bring in the voice of patients so that you're not um, you know uh, practicing and implementing policies and programs without really listening to and incorporating the relevant and real world context of the people who will be impacted by by those decisions. Um, and so I have served sort of as a, as, a, as a person advocate, I won't say patient advocate always because people don't typically see themselves as patients in their normal day-to-day -day lives. They see themselves as patients where, when they're in front of a clinician having a conversation or in a, or, you know, in a hospital setting or when they're feeling the consequences of being ill. Um, but, but it's really about the human experience and, um, and really being deliberate about bringing that perspective in so that the end user of whatever is designed and developed is, um, is, is readily accepted and, and we can achieve the, the, the best outcomes possible. Absolutely fantastic work. And we're gonna dig into that in a little bit. Just gonna move this up to Katina. Um, Katina, you are obviously doing a lot of work around the health literacy media or the HLM group. Tell us a little bit about how you got there and what, sort of, what sorts of themes and objectives of your organization. Sure. So um, I, I really got to health literacy media in a roundabout way. I'm a social worker. I was um, practicing social work. I worked at Washington University in the School of Medicine for a very long time um, doing research all around the world. I was interested in HIV prevention and drug abuse research with pretty vulnerable high-risk populations. Um, so I spent a lot of years doing that and then life changed um, and it was time to reconsider opportunities. And so I found myself at this small nonprofit that is Health Literacy Media. Um, we're a small group in St. Louis. There are 14 of us, um, but we work around the world. And our goal is to um, ensure that health communications across the board from our partners are health literate and accessible. And um, we want to make sure that everything our partner organizations write or share with their verbal communications are clear and easily accessible to the intended audience. And that's really the trick here. Um, it's not just about making it easy or as some people would say, um, using plain language or other strategies to dumb something down. Um, we, we don't wanna do that. We wanna really strengthen the writing, the clarity and make sure that the intended group of people can look at a material the first time and understand what, what the writers meant. Um, so that they can make important health decisions for their own for their own context. So that's that's the work we do. Love it and access and so much of that and the, just the concept of literacy is a whole science onto itself, which we can probably right. get into. So Deborah, just moving to you as well because I know that you are doing a lot of work with the C3T project um, and want to kind of delve a little bit deeper in this whole area around clinical trials. Now. We can start with COVID-19 because that's obviously the topic on everybody's minds. If we want it or not, <laughs> it's everywhere. Is there, I have never seen so much mass media explaining drug mechanisms of action than I have in the news over the last two or three months. You have like the average, you know, citizen who now can talk to you about mRNA versus, you know, traditional vaccines and on and on it goes. So I'm just kind of curious is as we start to see these big pharma companies coming out and looking at positioning 
and messaging their drug versus the others. And there's opportunities for clinical trials with vaccines and booster shots and all those sorts of things. Where would do you see clearly communicating clinical trials or C3T playing in this space um, and in the in the weeks and months ahead? So Deborah? well, <clears throat> I think that um, C3T and those of us who are involved in talking to patient communities can be very involved in the whole thing. I don't know how you feel or not, but I've read most of that information and I've talked to people about it. And the real question back to you would be, do you, do you understand all of it? Do you think that people who are trying to look it, up the information understand it? It's still written at a very high level. P people write for their own peers normally, unless they've been trained uh, in the ways that HLM works with health literacy. And you have to approach it from a totally different position than, than the perspective that companies have and science and medicine has. You have to approach it from a person's standpoint. And the interesting thing about COVID-19 is that I've heard so many people through the last almost year talk about the uncertainty and how that makes them feel and they don't know what to do and there's not enough information and how do I make a decision? How do I make choices? What are my choices? Um, all of that is stuff that people who become patients deal with in their daily life. Uh, people who have chronic illnesses, who have life-threatening illnesses, um, diseases, medical conditions, uh, come to me and, and we've had discussions about this and saying, hmm, that's interesting. The rest of the world is beginning to understand how we have felt every day. And so there's a lot, I think, that patient communities can bring to this, even if they don't focus on COVID, because it's the same basic human issues that everyone has when they become aware of possibly being a patient. Uh, clinical trials is a major area that I work in, and it covers everything from uh, preclinical to clinical to epidemiology to population health to healthcare delivery kind of research. So when we talk about clinical trials, it doesn't just mean drug development. It actually means how do we get new things, you know, devices, everything to people in better ways that give them better choices and options so that they can get better results. And I use different words uh, a lot of the time, especially with patient communities than we normally do in medicine. And that's just another example of how C3T I think can help because it covers a lot more than uh, just the clinical trials. It also can cover the results of those and what those results mean to people. So Katina, just moving to you around how people are grasping complex science. What are some of the nuggets or wisdom that you would share for like, for example, with a typical pharmaceutical company on how to approach the language to capture the understanding of the average, you know, healthcare consumer? Sure. I think that's a great question. And you know, one of the things that we really focus on is the need to know information versus the nice to know. So going back to your example of all of this information about the mRNA and all of this um, fancy science information, I would really challenge whether that's the most important information the public needs to know anyway. Um, you know, what I hear in my communities are people are trying to figure out where they are on the list and how they're going to know when it's their turn and where to go and what needs to happen before and after. There are these practical skills that are completely absent from almost every conversation because we're caught up on the sexy science. Um, and that's, that's exciting to me as a scientist, and I think it's exciting to lots of other scientists and journalists and folks that um, think about where the money is in this activity. But sort of the human, the human scale of this is how do we get, you know, vaccinations in people's arms? How do we get people in communities to then um, uncertain for very important reasons um, to embrace that this is an important thing that that is um, necessary for all of our communities. And we're not having those communications as much as we should. Um, so I really worry about that. Um, and how do we sort of filter out what people really need to know versus what's nice to know um, and what we would like them to know because it's sort of glamorous and new and exciting. 
Um, and I think that's one of the things that we target most with companies to help them understand. Um, and then the second thing really is, is going back to um, Deb's work. How do, how do we get back in touch with these patient populations and community groups and ask them? Um, so over and over again, we write materials. We do a really good job. We have groups of writers. Um, we do our best based on all the known science. Um, but then we go out and ask patients how they understand it. And what we find is they understand a lot of the technical information very easily um, once we write it in a public facing way and, and we, we think about plain language. Um, but what we don't always do perfectly without their input is put it in context of their lives. Um, so when we talk about the level of pain um, or what people should expect after or, or um, what the results mean or how much change they might experience, um, we often do that in ways that don't directly um, translate to them without their input. So figuring out how to talk to patients early and often and make sure that we check the way that we talk about things, I think is a really important skill. And the companies definitely um, embrace that once they understand it. We have those conversations a lot. I love that you mentioned that. It, is so, it fits so perfectly in this new world of precision medicine that we keep mm -hmm. talking about all the time. So I really like to get your perspective, Catherine, on this, because again, everything that you've talked about, especially as it relates to what your organization does at PAIR, has to do with population health management. So one intuitively deduces that when you're talking about population health, you're getting away from this idea of precision medicine, or as Katina was mentioning, how does this affect me as an individual? How do I leverage that particular information for my particular condition. Um, how, do, how do we manage that potential conflict, if you will, or, or disconnect between managing the mass and communicating to the mass versus dealing with things at an uber precision medicine uh, format? I think you're muted, Catherine. Thank you. <laughs> it has to happen on every call, right? <laughs> Uh, so I'm the targeted one today. Um, first, I before I answer your question, I just want to put a plug in for Health Literacy Media because I have personally worked with Katina and her team for many, many years, uh, over almost a decade, actually. And, um, and the work that they do is absolutely amazing. And we, you know, I think that I have some degree of expertise in writing clearly and simply uh, and when I send something over to Health Literacy Media and it comes back, they have applied their magic and their artwork and their science to making it a brilliantly, easily understandable material, whether it's a website, a screenshot, an app or a document. Um, it's really fascinating to see what, what people can do to, to make communications understandable, which is the whole intention in the first place. Um, but you asked about this, you know, I look at it as a spectrum where you've got um, population health on one end, where you're looking at large numbers of people and trying to make decisions around what is the most effective approach in, in helping to address particular illness within that population or complications of illnesses together versus the targeted individual perspective of really, you know, hyper-focusing on one person with their particular biological makeup, the issues that they're facing, and importantly, the context of their life. Um, and I, you know, I think you have to be able to, as an organization, to sort of move fluidly uh, along that spectrum based on what you're trying to achieve. So if you are looking for a, you know, a personalized medical approach to a particular um, condition that's you know, very specific and, and maybe, you know, it's, it's a, a, a sub, subtype of a, of a disease, you really need to look at that personalized approach. There might be biomarkers that you can leverage to identify the, the population of individuals that will respond best to a particular treatment. But also if you're looking at some of the broader sort of uh, epidemiological waves of diseases that we're seeing in really across the globe, like obesity and diabetes. I mean, there are pretty well known proven approaches to managing populations with those conditions 
that are tried and true doesn't mean that you know it's it's always effective and we're we're clearly not uh, addressing the the rates the continuing increasing rates of diabetes and and obesity um, as we should but there are approaches that work for the the vast majority of people um, and so it really depends on what you're seeking to achieve where you sit on that spectrum of population health uh, and using those principles versus personalized healthcare, which is much more specific to the individual. I love it. And it, it really is, uh, like you said, a spectrum and having that agility to be able to move back and forth. And that re requires very special skill sets, I think, to do that. So moving to your to you, Deborah, on this whole idea around drug discovery, and we're, we're kind of in this era of like rapid expansion. I think that if there's anything that we're going to learn and remember back back on COVID-19 is it's acted a bit like an accelerant. There's been a lot of momentum around technological innovation and adoption. And this certainly has affected patients, healthcare consumers in a big way, um, first and foremost on, um, on how, for example, clinical trials are conducted. We've seen a, a temporary moratorium on them because people got into a big scuffle is like, oh my goodness, how are we gonna do this? We were having our diabetes patients doing these six minute walks and, you know, we no longer can do this. And, you know, what are we going to do to quickly being able to adopt new methodologies and new endpoints and other sorts of things very rapidly to getting into a place of what we're calling decentralized trials. Can you talk a little bit, Deborah, about what you have seen as being the evolution of how we're involving patients in the new way that we're discovering new drugs? Okay, um, I think we're still in the infancy stage as far as clinical trial sponsors are concerned, but there is movement in the right direction. And what I would say are a, a couple things. There, uh, COVID has taught us a lot. There are a lot of things that we need to keep that are good about what we've learned during COVID-19 period. And uh, I am a big believer that we need to keep many of the changes that happened overnight, quote unquote, which wasn't really overnight, but happened quickly, especially in, in the research sense of the word. Um, you know, a lot of the things that are happening are things that we've been asking for and pushing for for years because they're better for patients. Being able to have more localized care or procedures or tests done. You don't always have to go to the fancy medical center. That's a major barrier for a lot of people, especially, and it's not just in the rural areas, actually in urban areas as well. Um, so things like that, being able to have home monitors, um, some of the technology that can be used. The thing I keep reminding everyone about the technology is if, if there are a couple uh, uh, probably a few different concepts that would be important to remember if you don't remember anything else from this conversation. <laughs> One is context, and Katina brought that up. We've got to put information in context for people, whether it's in print or talking or audio or video, whatever it is. Number two is we have to remember to use WIFIP first before product and regulatory focused. WIFIP is a, is a marketing concept that I've kind of um, enhanced. Instead of WIFM, which is what's in it for me, it's WIFIP, what's in it for patients, right? So if we have all this whiz bang new technology and you know digital monitors and all that that we can put into clinical trials, woohoo! The the message that comes across too often is, oh, this is a way we can get more from you trial participant, notice I don't use the S word, known as subject, um, the trial participants are participating and contributing for a reason. Sometimes it's personal, sometimes it's for other people, often it's for both, but um, they need to get something out of the technology as well. And the good news is there's a lot that can be given back to the trial participants, but we have to think about it that way first. Um, and then they will be more receptive to using some of that technology and making things happen. We have to think again, from the trial participant standpoint, what is it that we can do to make it easier for them to participate in this study? What can we do to make it easier for the site to, 
to think about this study, to talk to their potential participants about it, and then to keep people in the study. Um, there are different words that we use, things like adherence and compliance or retention even. From a patient standpoint, it's an endurance test. So again, if you think about how that changes your mindset and approach to the clinical trial, it can completely change the way we communicate with people, the way we think about designing the study from the beginning, which is very, very important. And I think one another thing that COVID is teaching us that I haven't heard a lot of people think or talk about is it's really important for us in the, in the era of precision medicine to actually do what we say we're doing and learn which subpopulations are going to do better with certain alternatives than others. So in a good example is we have two mRNA vaccines already approved in the US. There are other ones coming down the pike that work differently. We just heard about the you know more recent one that looks like it has less effectiveness. So you know of course the the medical community is saying, well, why would anybody want that? Well, there are a lot of people who aren't going to be able to take the first two the 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 type of mRNA vaccine, or it might not work for them as well. So again, we need to learn why are certain people having lung issues? Why are certain people having more diabetes? Why are they having heart conditions? Not everybody is the same and population health actually knows that. And that's, I think, where the spectrum that Catherine talked about is so important. So we have to go from understanding the population that we want to start with, but then how do we start to piece out the information that's useful for smaller and smaller groups of people and hopefully for individuals then. Beautiful. So and the most important question always, I'm sorry, is, is why? Why are we doing this? What's in it for patients? And why should they consider our clinical trials? Brilliantly said. And there's just so much in there. I kind of want to dig in. Um, Katina, there, there was a lot said there. And, you know, as we as we kind of break apart or double click a little bit on all these technological innovations that have allowed manufacturers and clinical trial organizations to be able to re-engage patients in the discovery process. We're kind of in an era of, of accelerated you know, discovery. Is what, what are we saying to patients so that they understand all of those elements that Deborah has just discussed? What's in it for the patient? How are we wanting them to learn um, and, and how do we get people to adopt, especially when we start running into issues around technology access or language barriers or other social economic status barriers, which sometimes can act as, as um, like I said, barriers to adoption. So how does your team help people to overcome some of these issues? Sure. So, you know, I started sharing that I'm a social worker. So when we start to talk about these things, it really um, speaks to me often more as a social worker than it does, frankly, as a health literacy professional. Um, so one of the things that, that I think is fascinating is we're talking about sort of the rapid acceleration um, that seems to be happening in industry, but I'm not sure that communities are experiencing that in the same way. Um, so when we talk about how do we express that to patients, I'm not sure they feel the difference yet. Um, and I'm not sure that it's being communicated really at all because you know there's certainly a race toward vaccines um, and it's the right race, right? It's important to get um, a vaccination program in line so that people can get, get themselves safe, get back out into the community, get back to their life. And that's sort of what everybody wants. Um, but the communication piece between what's happening to make that happen in communities, I think is missing um, some pretty significant um, some, some pretty significant steps. So, so I would say it's not really being communicated that well. And I would, um, I would certainly ask both Deb and Catherine to, to, you know, say something different if they feel that that's true. But I think the focus is um, really split right now and companies and governments are doing one thing. Um, communities are sort of holding their breath and waiting to be told and waiting to figure it out. And, and we've not sort of um, distilled the information where there is, um, the outcome for communities yet. The what's in it for me hasn't directly happened yet. Um, so I think that's part of what Deb's point was, is 
you know, it's fantastic that we've finally had a reason to do the things that patients and communities of patients have been asking for for, for decades. Um, so now let's actually do it and let's apply it beyond COVID um, to all these other um, issues. And, and we're seeing that in patient communities now in many ways. Um, so the patients who are the most vulnerable, for example, um, are still feeling challenged to even be in line for COVID vaccination, right? Um, so what's in it for them? Um, nothing yet, right? They, they don't even know when their turn is gonna be. Um, they don't know when they're gonna be a priority. So how do we have those conversations? What's sort of fair, what's reasonable? Who's the right voice? Um, you know, the government voice is, has got a very um, steep hill to climb with their message. Um, companies like ours are tiny, so we don't have a big enough voice to do it. Um, there's a lot of different focus. So I think, I think trying to figure out who's the right voice, what's the right message, and how do we make sure that the acceleration doesn't um, die when we have enough vaccinations and, and this, this current crisis is over. Deborah, Can you I were say something. Yes, I just wanted to add to yeah. that. I think you know what we've been talking about are people who are already somewhat receptive to the medical system or may be a part of it, but there are many that are disenfranchised mm -hmm. who mistrust uh, for good reason the, the medical system and frankly, the systemic racism that has been built into the system. This is an opportunity for us with COVID and with Black Lives Matter and all the things that have happened in 2020 to actually start building new building blocks that make sense for everyone, not just for people who are already in the system. Um, because it's bad enough for those of us that are already in the system, let alone for those who, who haven't even participated in, in the medical health systems. Um, so I just, I wanted to bring that up because that's another area that I'm working on. Uh, there are a lot of groups out there that are really trying to push that and have that as their main focus. It's really important for the rest of us to not only support them, but to take action with them. It's so well said. I actually just saw and read about some things recently, everything from, you know, super niche, how people communicate in their own communities. Like you were saying, they, they, they relate in different ways, so much so that there was a video of, some, of a girl recently who was communicating with sign language for the African American language of, of how they speak and, and how they communicate. It's its own super niche and it's unique. And how do we translate that? So Catherine, would love to get your speak, your, your thoughts on this is that we're running into, and I, I like to see this as an opportunity to change. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what are some of the things that we can do to overcome some of these language barriers, these, these issues of understanding um, with these super niche communities that lie before us? Thank you. Uh I'm, I'm actually so excited because I think that this is a once in a lifetime opportunity and COVID has been a catalyst for so much possible change for the better. And, and I look at populations with a global perspective and not just the, the people that we serve in the United States healthcare system, but globally, there are more niches than you can count in terms of types of, of communities and people that we need to reach. But I think the first thing that I think is, is critically important, and I know Christine Sorensen is on the line and she's the CEO of the Global Health Literacy Academy and a true expert in this space. So much of what I'm speaking about, I'm sure I've learned from her. She should probably be the panel re replacing me. Um, but I, I think it's critically important just to step back and to ask people to share their views and to really listen to their concerns and how they're feeling about the health issue that you're presented with. In this case, it's obviously COVID. Um, and, and to answer their questions and invite that dialogue because so often we don't listen or attend to the people again that for whom these services are intended. And there's a, a comment, you know, nothing about me without me meaning you've got to bring the intended person who's going to be participating into the conversation early and often in order to be inclusive of, of what's meaningful to them. And that's true certainly in the clinical trials arena. Um, 
so listen is first. I think this the second uh, most important thing is really to appreciate that language matters. The words that you use matter. And when we're talking about vaccine acceptance in the context of COVID, it's important to stress the benefits of taking the vaccine versus the consequences of not taking it and the, the potential to return to normal versus you know, the predictability or certainty. Um, talking about the medical experts who did research um, versus, you know, pharmaceutical companies um, and, uh, you know, that ran clinical trials. I mean, that's not language that everyone around the globe can really relate to. Um, talking about the benefits to yourself and to your family and your community versus your obligation to society. So, I'm, I'm giving examples of how phrasing the words really makes a big difference to, to people and the words you choose sometimes need to be tailored to the populations or the context that you're um, addressing at the time. So um, I think, you know, listening, selecting your words with intentionality. And thirdly, um, engaging in a way so that people who have uh, the engagement with the healthcare professionals are, are, are actually feeling appreciated and valued and are brought into the system so that there is some kind of follow-up. So ensuring that the experience has been authentic, uh, compassionate, um, timely, appropriate, and having a, a positive experience like that will, in, will make people more inclined to leverage the healthcare services wherever they are in whatever um, capacity that, that there is to serve them in, in a much better way. We, want, we need to invite people in um, into the world of health promotion and health prevention and, and health protection um, so that we can have a, a, a better global health um, for all. Uh, and I think you know, the COVID vaccine um, is a, again an opportunity to do that. So Catherine, you bring up some really interesting things that um, without getting too controversial, I'd love to discover and delve into with the three of you. Um, what has also transpired with COVID-19 is an identification with the varied perspectives on reality. I think that if we've seen anything through the change in the administration is that you can have two people looking at exactly the same thing and have completely different interpretations of it. One can say the same thing potentially about the way we are voicing and explaining and expressing health. In some ways, what we're talking about, which is altruism, doing the right thing, doing it for the global good, you know, sharing your data, doing this to help others. And so you have very specific groups of people that will hear that message, will resonate with it and will condone to that. And other people who are completely going to rebel against it and call it a human rights uh, violation. So Deborah, I'm just kind of curious uh, from your perspective, as we think about the myriad of perspectives, realities, um, viewpoints that the US and the world has, is how do we bring these messages of health and prosperity, you know, even, even something as simple as mask wearing, um, that, you know, rapid testing, all those sorts of things that people can be very weary of what can we do to convey this to the myriad of, um, of people out there? Well, that's a really good question. And it's one that we're all going to have to grapple with for you know decades to come. I hope someday we actually get the solution there rather than having to deal with it forever. But um, I think it boils down again to context and, and putting it in the context that people live their daily lives with. Okay, so what I mean by that is what does, again, what's in it for me? What's in it for my family? What's in it for uh, the health system that may make sense for me and may not make sense for me? We've got to start being real about what the advantages and disadvantages are for the individual, for their family, and then for the health system itself, no matter what country you're in. Um, because these thoughts are everywhere. Um, 
and they are varied. I have them in my own family um, and varied opinions. And so the way that I try to address that is, okay, there are certain things that we know in science and in medicine, and there are certain things we don't know. COVID is one of the big unknowns, but we're learning as we go. It's gonna be confusing. So let's boil it down to uh, put it in analogies that make sense to people in their lives. So it, I'll, this isn't a COVID example, but it could be. Um, you know, Using the example of a puzzle and all the different steps that have to happen to complete a complicated 1000 piece puzzle for example, right? What does it take? Well, first of all, you have to look at a picture. You have to know what it's supposed to be, right? What our end result is supposed to be. Then you have to dump everything out and start sorting things out. Then you have to put colors together or you know, a lake versus a mountain or whatever it is. And sometimes you get the wrong piece because it looks like it could be something else. So if you start to think about what is it that, that everybody could understand and have in common, and then how do we use those types of examples to explain where we are or what this piece of it is? And then how do we get more health literate information that not only helps somebody explain that one mRNA vaccine, but how that compares to the others that are being built and what, again, that means to the person, to their family members and friends, and to the health system, right? And to our general public population, our economics issues and possible solutions. You know, if we can get people out and about without having to worry about getting sick and even possibly dying, then we're going to be okay economically because people can get back into real life start buying things again, working again, life will get better. And, and so we have to keep it in perspective and build all of those things in because that's one thing as a patient, and I'll, I promise I'll stop after this comment. <laughs> um, so often in research and in clinical trials and population health even and stuff, we look at that one thing that's important medically, right? And that's all that's focused on. When in a person's life, people talk about real world evidence and data and all of that. Well, guess what? Clinical trial information is, is shades of gray, black and white and shades of gray. A person's life is a full rainbow of colors that includes their social aspect, their family, their work situation, insurance or not, um, you know, what type of of uh, socioeconomic status do they have, race, culture, ethnicity. I mean, we can just go down the list. There's a rainbow of colors in every single person's life. We need to remember that and figure out how to bring in some of those things because that's what the, the person and the patient is having to deal with is how does this medical thing fit into the rest of my life? Some really important points, and I'd like to get your perspective as well, Katina, on this, but I think what's really important here is we have this world of, you know, accelerated change and basically havoc. We're, we've got this melange. We oftentimes call this, um, you know, uh, complex, you know, we need to use innovations or systems innovations thinking because it's, it's, a, it's a quagmire of complexity. And so as you really have adopted or suggested, Deborah, it really is like a thousand piece puzzle. And so one needs to look at incentivization, how are people incentivized to do what they do, et cetera. But one of the things that's really core in what Deborah shared was sort of a primary premise that people will understand science or the primary method of, of how we build hypotheses we draw analogies based on, you know, on research, and then we, we draw conclusions. But then we also realize that there's some people who think of pseudoscience and alternative realities and a myriad and mesh of all of this. How does one in your particular role in the associations and organizations you work with try to navigate and pierce this so that you can create some semblance 
of continuity and consistency in beliefs or understanding about what we're conveying to people? Yeah, so th I think that's a great question. And, and you know, we, we, we talk a lot about um, this idea of misinformation and, and health information in particular, this is a challenge and we're fascinated by it as um, sort of writers and thinkers and, and scientists. But the reality is um, if you take the time to communicate either in written communication or verbal communication, information that is um, clear to the best of your ability and written at a level that's appropriate to the intended audience, um, you're giving them the tools to read and process the information on their own um, or hear it if, you, if you've presented it in, in a verbal way, um, but to process that on their own, put it in the context of their life and make decisions. So if you can strip all the rhetoric and get down to the facts and explain them in a clear way that is um, transparent, as simple as you can, um, while still not losing the core elements and the accuracy, um, people do understand. And we know this because in the C3T program, we write a lot of clinical trial summaries based on a lot of really complicated science. That's what we do. Um, we take these really complicated science protocols. Um, we pick out all the critical elements. We put them in a very short template um, for people to read who are living with the experience. And then we ask them, what do they read and what do they understand? And they tell us over and over again that they can process the information. They can put it in the context of their life. Um, this is what we want to know. This is what we need to know. These are the things that are important to us. Um, some of this stuff is what's important to you. Um, they can sort of rank those and factor those out on their own. Um, what people don't like to do is sort of deal with um, sort of the rhetoric and um, all of the other information that is not need to know. So I think as health communicators, that's what's really important for us is to sort of pull out the politics, um, pull out the pieces of information that aren't relevant to not make this about anything other than clearly communicating the most important information people need to know so they can make decisions for themselves or their family in the context of their own life. Um, we don't need to pretend that people aren't capable of doing that. We need to respect them. We need to respect their communities. We need to respect their community um, stakeholders and um, you know, elders and all the people who are involved in helping deliver information. Um, so if we haven't gotten it exactly to the level of an individual, there are other people around who can help. Um, but they can't do that if we don't take the time to, to clearly communicate the science and do it in a way that's um, really transparent, factually accurate, and not political ever. Does that make sense? Does that help? Yeah, absolutely. Catherine, you had something you wanted to add to that as well. Yes, I've, I've raised my hand. Um, I think the source of that information is also critically important mm -hmm. when it comes to trust. So what's been really interesting is that employers are the number one most trusted source of information as it relates to COVID, which is fascinating, you know, more so than the World Health Organization, more so than the CDC. And so we have this extraordinary opportunity to bring employers to the forefront and have them be leaders in promoting vaccine confidence and providing information in a way that people, that their employees can appreciate it. Uh, so, you know, the World Economic Forum is working on this. I'm a member of the Global Chief Medical and Health Officers Network. We, I, I'm actually leading the vaccine confidence work stream. And when you think about the number of people who are employed in this country at 150 million or so, although that may be lowered right now, um, because of because of COVID, I mean that represents a lot of people who could be um, you know communicated with around COVID vac vaccination by their employers, um, and so if we can start to untap that as a mechanism to create health, uh, it, it could be extraordinary. So em employers having a voice in this environment and um, and providing information that is understandable and clear and, you know, whether it's a series of pictographs or an audio tape or uh, an app mechanism, however you can communicate that if employers could participate in that, it would be incredibly helpful. And in the last five minutes, just gonna quickly do a, a rapid fire and each of you to respond quickly. But the question around technology, I mean, one of the things I'm hearing very clearly from all of us is that the world has changed forever in so many respects, but most importantly, the way we communicate. 
it's no longer this band-aid response in a public health policy that thou shalt, this shalt apply to everybody. We realize that everybody's in their own predicament, in their own situation. We've never seen such an uprising of um, nationalities, languages, um, social economic status patterns, uh, all kinds of other things that bring specific niche populations to the surface that need to be communicated and articulated in their own unique niche ways. So just curious about your perspective on how we might be able to leverage technology, telemedicine, apps, other sorts of things, using CPT3, even these AI type of things that create their own unique machine learned messaging to people so that we can get ultra uber, you know, specialized in the messaging. I'd love to get your perspectives, you know, in a <laughs> rapid fire, what you think technology is going to do in this realm moving forward. Starting with you, Deborah. Well, that's a uh, $1 million question, I think. Um, I would say what's really important is some of the messages that we've included here. You've got to, first of all, understand that not all people are alike. We have to listen to them, learn what their differences are, what's important to their group, right? Unfortunately, we've seen a lot of tribalism going on this year in, all across the world what's important to them about their tribe and how, how can we fix a win-win together with that aspect? Because we're not gonna be able to get that away from people right now. Uh, I guess I'll stop there and let the others go. Katina? Sure, I, you know, I think as Deb said, a million dollar question, but, but the reality to me is um, health is personal, obviously, and um, the ways that we communicate are also personal. And so I think that what we need to keep in mind in technology is um, everything needs to be on the table all the time. It's not about um, having one written material or one conversation or one app. It is having all of those things so that people can choose what, what works for them and be able to sort of look at it or listen to it or hear it again, um, ask questions. They need to be able to interact in the ways that function in, in their own life, in their own situation. And that means that we have to build it all, all the time, um, and then trust people to make good choices for themselves and, and be available to sort of help and supplement. Brilliantly said. And Catherine, your thoughts? Yep, I'll, I'll finish it up. I think technology, I mean, obviously technology is an enabler and it can you know, be used to expand and scale information to billions of people instantaneously, but it has to be balanced with the human touch. It has to be balanced with a dose of humanity. Um, you know, one example is the enormous benefit of telemedicine in um, mental health and behavioral health space. Uh, it's been shown to be incredibly helpful, but you first need to have established a personal relationship with the clinician and the patient in order for that technology to be um, optimized in terms of, of managing care and treatment. So, uh, you know, it's, it's an enabler, but it must be balanced with the human, with the ever important human touch. Absolutely. Deborah, you had one uh, last thought. One last thought. Um, everybody wants to feel secure, right? And cared and, and like someone cares for them. So if we keep that and you think about how you have felt through your COVID experience this last year, no matter who you are and where you've been, what are the thing, elements that are important there for people to know and understand that we do care about them and there are solutions or at least options for them to think about, but we have to help them put it in perspective so they can make the choices that are right for them. So the whole point about health literacy and, and uh, HLM is not only understandable information, but actionable information so that someone can make choices that make sense for their particular life situation. Honestly, we could be speaking for hours on this. And I know that once we can figure out how to solve some of the immediate local issues, dealing with the global issues in you know, 2022 and 2023 and beyond, probably have another discussion with the three of you at that point, because this is very, very important stuff. Um, for those of you, I want to thank everybody for listening in um, or listening to this afterwards. Um, we are going to be leaving in the show notes, the connections and being able to contact Katina, Catherine, or Deborah, in case you have any further questions, you want to partner, you want to find out how you can work with them, 
we are going to provide that. Um, I also welcome you to check out impetusdigital.com. If you're interested in these kind of discussions and want to have these over time, working with patients, patient advocates, healthcare providers, allied healthcare stakeholders, to be able to help solve some of these complex using innovations, systems thinking, and doing this over time asynchronously or synchronously, this is what Impetus does. So we'd love to have that discussion with you if you're interested in finding out how to do that. So thank you everybody for your time today. Please like and subscribe so other people can find this information and what, wishing everybody a wonderful day ahead.